Hello everyone, I am Corey Andrew Powell and this is Motivational Mondays. I am super thrilled today to be joined by Michael Harriet. Michael is a critically acclaimed journalist, poet, author, and cultural critic. Uh, cultural critic, that's a tough one to say, but he's been hailed as one of the most eloquent writers in America. I must say I agree, I'm a fan. He's a senior writer for The Guardian and TheGrio.com and he and his work are featured often in various media outlets like The Washington Post, uh, The Atlantic, MSNBC, and more. Today, we're gonna be discussing Michael's new book called Black AF History, and y'all can figure out on your own what the AF is for. We will leave you to that. But the full title is Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America by Michael Harriet. There's the book there. And Michael, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. And um, as I told you before we started, I love your work. I follow you. And I, I think I'm drawn to you not just the honesty and what you put forth when you're doing your pieces about race relations or just social issues, but I do like that you inject humor and sarcasm <laughs> a lot into your work. And I did wonder just as a, um, from a technical standpoint, because that's almost like a trait. I mean, people, they expect that from you. And I wondered, is that something that you inject intentionally because maybe it makes difficult subject matters more ingestible or digestible to people? Or are you just like an inherent like wise ass and <laughs> you want to get that across as well in your work? So which one is it? Or is it a little bit of both? I think it's a little bit of uh, all those. I think just when you write, uh, you know, in your own voice, I am a little bit of a wise ass so I think I just don't take out the jokes if I'm talking about something serious. Um, so I just don't feel the, the need to remove them. And sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it'll be just a little bit of sarcasm. But I think, you know, I think people notice funny more. But, you know, if you're serious and you inject some seriousness into it, you know, people might not notice it, or if you inject some vitriol or, you know, or, uh, but I think people just, you know, notice funny because there's a, a human reaction of laughter that accompanies it. Yeah. I mean, it was immediate for me reading the book. Like there were certain things that I was like really involved, like reading the passage, for example, like, um, but there, there's a part about religion and the land grab that you mentioned with like Portugal and Spain. I don't, you know, won't give America's history away because that it's, you know, people can go find it, but you make this joke about like, it, it was like the biggest debate that's not been seen since the debate of Michael Jackson versus Prince. And, <laughs> so, and I didn't expect that. So I love that you inject it in these really serious contexts um, about your subject matter. And then I think for me, it actually, it does lighten it up because there are some serious stuff you cover, which I will just jump right into now, the book. Um, given the current landscape now when history is somewhat trying to be erased or whitewashed, if you will, I wonder, was this book a response to that or were you already working on this and then just real life caught up to you? Yeah, I was. So I was already working on it um, and like real life caught up to me. As a matter of fact, the book, so I signed a uh, two book deal, right? And the way that came about was I had pitched a book called White Peopleology. Uh, and it was kind of a, a look at race through economics. But when I, so they were, uh, people were interested in that. And then a book about history, right? But when I, you know, uh, signed the deal, they were saying, well, I don't know about the, the white peopleology book title. Like, do you, what do you think about the title? Because, you know, the subtitle is still like, I've never heard of it. Nobody's ever heard of it. I don't know if you have to do a lot of explaining. And the, the subtitle of white peopleology was toward a more critical race theory. Mm, <laughs> and it right. was like, we'd never heard of critical race theory. Mm. Nobody had ever heard of it. Um, when I pitched this book, and so I was like, well, we might as well do the history book. Oh, and now, man. you know, if it had come out during this period where we are talking about critical race theory, I think, you know, it would have been, you know, really popular. Yeah, that's amazing. Some, you know, and that's a good like a lesson too. like sometimes the powers that be don't always know what's best. Right. Sometimes, you know, your gut instincts about your work is, is sort of like the best marker. Uh, but in any event, you know, um, the term AF is equally as culturally relevant. And so 
I wonder then what was your intention with this book? What was the mission that you set out to 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 do with this particular book? What I wanted to do um, was a couple things. So one, we see American history. Well, we see all of history through a certain lens. You know, when we talk about critical race theory, it is looking at the law and, you know, legal practices or whatever you're using critical race theory for um, through the lens of black people or through the lens of race, really. And we, what I think people don't recognize is that we see everything through the lens of race. Like white people are a race of people. They created the whole racial construct. And so we see history through a white racial construct, you know, most of the time. And, and there's so many examples of that. Like, you know, even, you know, people who talk about Africa, right, and the motherland, right? Like, they, why do they always use, like, Egyptian symbology, right? Because Egypt was close to Europe, and so we know the most about Europe, I mean, about Egypt, because white people told us about Egypt, right? Like, we never hear about West African deities. We never hear about, like, we always use Egyptian or the symbology that white people talk about when we talk about Africa. Um, when we talk about America, it's the same way, right? Like we see America through the lens of whiteness. And so I wanted to write a uh, book and it's not just the history of black people in America. It is a history of America through black people. If if that makes sense. So a lot of people, I think, have written about black people in America, but not necessarily about America through the lens of black people. Um, and I think that's really important, too, because part of your upbringing, it's I think it really sort of um, anchors you in this awareness of your blackness and of, of 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 history being told through our eyes versus white people's eyes which is your mother homeschooling you. And you talk about that in the book as well, which I thought was really uh, an interesting part because I wasn't homeschooled, but you, but that part of your life really speaks to the stories that are now being sort of rewritten and trying to be erased by people as not accurate, which are the actual stories. They've been passed down to us, like by actual people who live them. Like my great, 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 great grandmother died at 114. She was actually a slave. Like she died a free woman, but was born into slavery. Like that's real. So um, what I think is really important about this book is that you are dispelling a lot of the romanticized myths about America. And one of my favorites that you talk about that I have to bring out is the Pocahontas story. I mean, you know, let Disney tell it. It's a love story. And, you know, Vanessa Williams is singing a soundtrack and the blue corn moon and all. <laughs> but you tell a very, you know, you tell a very different story about it. So where does your research come from that you are confident that the story of Pocahontas that you're putting forward is the actual story? So my research comes from primary sources. Um, I did. So, uh, I, I, I did consult with historians, researchers, um, dig through primary sources. And, you know, the interesting thing about this book and the retelling of this history is that it's not necessarily a history that I uncovered myself. Like historians know this stuff is the truth, right? They just don't teach it to us. They just don't tell it to people in school. It's not like any of this stuff is buried and I uncovered it. There are some, a few stories that, that like I found in um, old newspapers that really aren't written about, but most of this stuff is known about, right? Like we know, <laughs> For instance, that like the ship that Pocahontas was kidnapped on and the ship that she went and returned to England on was the same ship that brought the first enslaved people to America. Like we never talk about like that. The tre Like look up Pocahontas at the treasury. You'll see. Wait, what? And, and it was surprising to me, too. So this history isn't necessarily hidden. Um, like they just refuse to teach it, and when I say they, I mean what the American education system is, has been romanticized into kind of a fairy tale that's digestible and, and engenders this notion of American exceptionalism. And 
the truth is that, you know, the original Americans were inept. They didn't know a whole lot of stuff. They, uh, you know, mostly were thieves. And so that dispels that myth. And I think that's why they don't tell it. Yeah, when you broke down the different countries that began to involve themselves in slavery and you get to how, of course, one of the most, I guess, prolific, if you will, and, and, and dominating colonizing forces would be would be England. And you, you break down why, why it failed many times for them to actually try to build and, you know, start colonies here. And you broke that down. And so I was wondering, yeah, like you just said, um, is that why you think you have a constant retelling? Are there, do you think there's a conscious effort not only to not tell the actual truth, but also to now continue to heroize or further heroize who might clearly just be the bad guys? I mean, they are not even might. I mean, they're the bad guys of the story. So you think that's what this this is a conscious effort to 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 do is like kind of like heroize them instead of telling the truth? I don't know. Like, so let's examine that, right? Like, you know, you are a pretty intelligent person and you read the book and you say you you learn some new stuff. Like it might just be because one of the things I always tell people is like we like to like idealize this grand conspiracy that is pro-white and anti-black. But a lot of it is just think about generations telling and learning this story. They think they know the real story, right? It's not because like, we're going to keep that away from them. Not, they think they know the real story, right? Their social studies book told them what it was. And so they tell children, the next generation of children, what it was. And like, I, like all my life, when I started going to public school, I've had teachers tell me, no, 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 that's, that's not right. And I was like, well, Okay, but if you look it up, you'll see. Like, I don't even, like, and the thing I guess I never did was argue about, like, because right is right. Like, why would you argue for the truth, right? Like, you just, when people say, nah, that's, okay. I mean, I'm okay. Like, you can believe the lie. So a lot of it is because they don't know. Like, I remember a couple, like, maybe, yeah, a couple years ago, when this whole CRT thing started and I said, I was going to look up a, take all these people who were promoting CRT, all of the senators who were writing um, legislation against it. Remember, cause there was even national legislation. And so I went to back to their high schools and looked up the specific social studies book that they used when they were in school. And it turns out like their history was whitewashed. Like they want, they might think, oh, they out there trying to make the founding fathers look good because they really believe that the founding fathers were heroes who were smart and knew how to do things. They weren't. But because that is so embedded, like we've created a society that has turned the myths into truth. And it has made us all dumber for believing the lies. You're saying from the standpoint of the ignorance of having been misinformed about their history through all these generations, as, as you just explained. Well, and well, like, let me explain. Like white people are generally. So and when I say that, let me explain that. Generally, white people are the most likely to not be corrected when they are wrong, mm. right? Like, so that's, I mean, just, that is a fact, right? Like, like white people can get away with being wrong better than most people in this, which creates, like, I'm not talking about, there's a difference between uneducated, right? right. Because if you learn all the lies and the lies are on the test, and then you are educated, but not Accurately. smart. Yeah. Right? So, White people believe this stuff. Like we will know, like does we know, even if we read the textbook, every black person knows there's some stuff in there that ain't true. Mm. Every well, especially... indigenous person knows there's something in there that ain't true. Right, right. White people get to be dumb. You know, I think of the Columbus story when we talk about that. Um, Christopher Columbus. It is so illogical the story to begin with, um, if you were to just take the word discovery at its own merit and just ask the question, how does someone discover something that already exists? Um, there was an entire community, an entire 
people living in their own construct of whatever their social constructs were. And it is, it, it is shocking to me that we still continue today, right now, to perpetuate that story uh, that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Now, granted, we're now starting to push back, right? We have Indigenous Peoples Day and all that. But I, what do you think about that? I mean, people still cling to that story, and it seems illogical. So the interesting thing about this story is that story, the Christopher Columbus story. Do you know how that story came to be, right? So after the American Revolution, you know, we were America now. And so we were kind of shedding off all things British, right? So we were rejecting our ties to Britain. And so we kind of adopted this Christopher Columbus myth as a rejection of the John Rolfe myth, myth the, of him being over here, right? So, because that, that was what was taught in schools then. And so Washington Irving gets a, a, a contract to publish Christopher Columbus's biography. And so he goes to England and just like, parties and get drunks with all the money, right? And never writes to be, so he comes back in there like, Why, where's the biography? So he writes the biography just with no research, just makes all this stuff up. And that's how the Christopher Columbus myth began, right? Like it was a dude like took the money and took, took the deal money and didn't turn in the album and just made something up at the last minute. And that's, we still believe in that Christopher Columbus myth because that, biography became the definitive story of Christopher Columbus life. Like Christopher Columbus wasn't even an Italian, right? And he's an Italian hero because of that myth. Yeah. Yes. I've had that debate with Italians when it came to like the parade in New York city being changed and they were changing it from the Christopher Columbus parade to the Italian heritage day parade. And someone said, well, that's not fair. Can't we have a hero? And I'm like, of course, but I don't think that's the hero that, you, I mean, you know, there's probably a whole lot of other actual Italian heroes. Christopher Columbus is not one of them. I've argued that a lot. So, um, you know, but it's shocking that it still gets taught in schools. And that along with, for example, the first Thanksgiving, this notion that, you know, they ate this turkey and the pilgrims and the natives sat across from each other. When you talk about the interactions with the natives and the settlers, it is so disturbing, the truth that you're sharing about the actual, well, first of all, how the Native Americans actually saved the settlers, felt sorry for them when they were starving. I mean, just talk a little bit about that, like in relation to how you talked about it was the first government welfare program, which I thought was pretty brilliant, because it really is. Yeah, so so we have to remember, like the, the Jamestown settlers were basically like the first settlers in America were aristocrats. So you think about aristocrats coming from England, they really didn't know how to build stuff. They didn't know how to farm, right? So they came over here and they literally, like you can read the diaries um, of, of John Smith. Uh, and he talks about like he was expecting to come over here and find like diamond trees and gold flowing through the streams. And so the first uh, settlers didn't know how to do stuff. They came over here and they almost died. So uh, they basically resorted to eating each other. And what saved them was the natives here were gracious enough to give them food. Um, it, it also just ha so happens that the English settlers came here during the worst drought, probably still in the history of this continent, hmm. um, which is, uh, you know, kind of, you got to think about the, godliness in that all right like I, god must have put it the here. universe like, i would see then y'all want to go over there we're gonna see um but um yeah so so the interaction with the natives was uh the natives extended them welfare and in exchange they stole the natives land and genocided them um and that was america's relationship with the natives uh for until today, mm -hmm. right? Like until you, well, at least until we're recording this podcast, right? <laughs> um, that's still that relationship. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I always say that history is not a thing about the stuff that happened. It explains the stuff that is happening. And that's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Your work also, to me, if there's another trait, I said, you know, 
you're defined, I think, by as you're writing style, sarcasm, and humor. Like as a wit, your wit is what we come to expect in your work. But I also really sense there's a strong bond that you have with the truth and wanting the truth. And I love in the book, and I'm gonna have to give a shout out to I believe it was Uncle Junior, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> because I have an Uncle Bucky who's also a junior. And it's amazing when I was reading that, I thought it was like reading about my own life because it was my Uncle Bucky and Earth, Wind and Fire. And it has to be on vinyl, okay? Because eight tracks and cassettes don't make, <laughs> don't make, is not the same. So anyone who reads the book would know that reference when they read it. But um, I love when you talk about how he was a storyteller and, but more so he was a truth teller. And I, and I do wonder if you can share a little bit about how that inspired you to be committed to the truth in your own work. Yeah, my uncle Junior was uh he was kind of a story. So my whole family are storytellers, but so my uncle Junior was like the fact checker in the family. Like he would sit around while everybody else told the stories. And be like, no, 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 no. That was 1978. And I remember because I remember you were in the sixth grade and I was in the eighth grade. <laughs> and he would tell, like he would correct the stories that everyone else told. And he was I always, but when he told the story, you could almost be absolutely sure it was correct. Like nobody else would correct his stories. <laughs> and so um, I, that that admiration I have for him, like extends like far and wide, mm -hmm. but it always, I like, I love to hear his stories because he would just ride, I would just ride in the car and he would just tell me stuff. And it, he also knew how to use a saw, a band saw and electrical equipment. So that was another thing. And uh, <laughs> like, he would always, like, I'm sitting here right now, picturing him, like telling me how, teaching me how to mop because he mopped decks mm -hmm. on a battleship in like Vietnam. And I don't think there were battleships in Vietnam, but uh, <laughs> he mopped the deck of a ship. And yeah. so he knew how to uh, mop. Yeah. Yeah, no, he sounds fascinating. And I love that. And I think you're, again, your family in general, how you paint the picture and your mom is a hero to me because she really instilled in you um, just the sense of of being and, and who you are. And I see that obviously as who you are today, you're very pro-Black, very uh, in your authentic self as a Black man. You know, you have the continent of Africa in back of you, you have the Black History Month shirt on, you know, and you own it. You know, we, I, I mean, I'm, I've, I'm the same way. Um, I do wonder, because I've had my experiences with this, has that been an ever a hindrance to you as you pursued your career? Like um, maybe scared people off from hiring you at some of the maybe corporate writing jobs or media jobs because I, I of it. I don't think so. Um, by the way, it's like a, a map of the world. Right. And like Africa's just in the center of it. <laughs> right, right. Like, like if it's Which is the truth of geography, quite right. honestly, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and so, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think that throughout my career, so my first job after college was at a HBCU. So I don't know if that mm. would have scared them. Yeah. And then, you know, writing, uh, I think when people read my writing, I've written for places that aren't like black centered places, mm -hmm. but I think generally I've did a good job. So I don't think they had a problem with it. Mm. And I don't know if it's well, and again, uh, I have most of, who I work for, I was thinking about this the other day. I really never kind of worked really for white people. Like even in the places that I worked where it was like not black centric, mm -hmm. I was hired by a black person. So right. um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think so. And, and I think also that as Americans, black Americans, we know how to temper our voices. I don't know. I've never learned how to do that. So I don't think that I think that people understand that, like, I'm not being, you know, anti white or whatever. Sometimes it comes off that way. But like, I just wasn't around white people. I don't know. How to, I act around white people like I act around black people. I treat white people like I treat black people. So I don't know how they could be upset. Anyone could be upset with that. Mm hmm. Right. So you're not, you don't do the code switching as we have um, talked about before in a podcast, which is, you know, people who don't know, it's like when, uh, in our case, a black person would get in front of 
a white community or environment and then we would change the way we speak or look or act to be um, more assimilated into that culture so you've never really had to you didn't, you've never really fooled with that <laughs> basically because your journey wasn't that way right right like i never think i think to do that you have to kind of accept inherently that like the whiteness is better because like the idea of code switching is like turning off yourself and turning on to the correct version. And I don't know if I could, could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting, um, yeah, that's a great assessment. Yeah. Cause you're being, you're being asked to reduce yourself to, um, to be something else basically that you're not. Yeah. And I do want to talk about geography for a second, because when I was a kid and, um, in public schools, I remember there was like the social studies map. The teacher would pull this big map out of the ceiling and it would be all of, of all the continents. And it was fascinating to me looking back because North America was the biggest continent. It was huge. It, was, it took up the entire board. And then way over in the little side was Africa, way over there, Australia. And then to learn later on that Africa was this huge continent and North America was actually dwarfed by it. Um, I find that that's also like a concerted effort to misguide, even with geography. Have you found that like with, with teaching and how Africa is sort of downplayed as a continent considering the yeah. contributions? So uh, yeah, I mentioned that all the time, right? Like, like for instance, the idea that there are Spanish people and Dutch people and English people and Portuguese people that came here and created a country and they bought Africans. Like this, anybody from that continent is just the African. They don't have a history, a culture, a religion, or anything. It's just like from a place, right? Not a political history, not a social history. They're just Africans, right? The idea also that, first of all, Europe is not a continent. Um, it's not. It's like like if you look at a map. I, I don't understand how people look at a map and then say that little carbuncle on Asia's butt is a <laughs> continent. I don't understand what, like, if you look at it, object, Europe is not a continent, right? It's just we made it a continent because it's where white people are from. Um, and so geography, a lot of like, again, it's not through... Like, I'm not looking at it through a black lens. I'm just looking at it not through a white lens. If you look at it objectively, if no one had ever told you what that Europe was a continent, if you looked up the definition of continent and then looked at a map and said, oh, yeah, I see Africa and I see that one, uh, Australia, and I see this big one, this big land map. But Europe ain't no continent. Um, so yeah, ge geography is viewed through the lens of whiteness as is everything in America. Well, I have to be honest. I have never heard that theory before about Europe not being a continent. However, well, it's not even a theory. Like I'm geographers I'm know, like we, it's a, what we could call a continent. Like we know like geographic constructs. Then what we're talking about, when we talk about continents, uh, the, all of the continents, except Europe is a social, Europe is a social construct, right? It is like, it is separate because of like, it's no geographic delineation, right? Like where does Europe end? You don't know. Cause like, it's just like an arbitrary thing. It is not a continent. Like it's weird. Like, again, this is one of those things that everybody, the, the experts generally agree and nobody ever, it doesn't filter down to your social studies book. On that note, Michael Harriet, thank you so much for being here. Author of Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America. Thanks for being here today on Motivational Mondays. Thanks a lot for having me. Great time.